Right? You got those three? What? Check and see your answers. Did you get the same for all these? Should you have gotten the same for these first three? Yeah. I mean, for the P and the E, the proton and electron? Yeah. All right. This is where it differs. The number of neutrons changes as you find different atoms. Now, why is it, if the neutron number can change, but it's still considered the same atom, they're called isotopes, right? In nature, you have naturally occurring atoms that we call the same element because of their proton and their electron number. The one that can vary is the neutrons. Now, there's one atom that doesn't have any neutrons at all. What's that? Hydrogen. Simplest one. All right? And so you guys, you're checking your answers. Let's go ahead and d define the difference between these, all right? Your official note to copy down, I guess, for our isotope would be, and this is just bare bones description of isotope. So let's add this to our notes. You notice carbon 12, carbon 14. That first example I gave you was carbon 12. Carbon 14. Now, I like this one because we're talking about the difference between uh, two isotopes that n naturally exist on our planet, and living organisms have carbon 14, and it degrades, it decays. When we get to evolution, we'll talk about uh, how we actually do carbon dating. Uh, so, same number, same atomic number, different neutrons. That's your bare bones difference between isotope. Yes. Um. Okay. So let's. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do, go over how to fill out that little the little dots, because this is the whole idea is starting to get to predict behavior. Proton numbers don't change. Can an electron number change? When it's interacting, what is chemistry? A flow of electrons, either a flow of electrons between two atoms where it's within their energy level and they're sharing it, or if it actually one jumps to another and it's ionic and there's some combinations in between, between that flow, uh, covalent, it actually has two parts. We're gonna learn polar and nonpolar. Nonpolar is what water is and that creates all that list of stuff that we're gonna talk about when we talk about properties of water. What was your question? Uh, ionic isotope. Okay, they're, contra they're different things. Uh, ion is an atom that is a atom that has a different number of electrons to protons. For example, um, chlorine is the atom. Chloride has one additional electron, and it gives it a negative charge. Sodium chloride is sodium and a chlorine atom interacting by one giving up an electron. Now remember one of those questions I asked earlier was what is um, what it actually causes the bond in the ionic bond? Alright? The all right, and we're gonna we're getting close to answering that, so we're getting close to answering that. Patience got uh, something. I think I can rephrase this question so that it makes more sense. Can you have an atom that is not it makes sense. and an isotope at the same time? Okay. If I were right to isolate, if I take this and this and they interact with sodium, this number would increase and this number would increase. So any of these can become an ion. So I guess an isotope can become an ion because an atom can, can become an ion. And what's the difference between what's an isotope? An isotope is well, an atom that has the same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons. Now, that atoms interact, and chemistry is atoms interacting with each other. So any of these, if I wrote sodium chloride, um, and you had to calculate the molecular mass, and you didn't know the mass number, you would default to your periodic table. Remember, if you don't have this, you default to your periodic table. Now, we can get in which one of these is the dominant element. When you guys learn chemistry, you're going to have this where you do a calculation and you figure out which one is the most widely seen out on our planet or in the solar system. So I, I like, it's more like you see this one more than some of the other ones, but that's irrelevant for what we need. Did I answer your question? Okay, so 
let's go back to this and talk about how we're going to do predict behavior. And we lost a little time today because of the fire drill. So I, uh, I want us to, and I'll probably film the models of ions and uh, bonding shortly, but let's do this. So first ring, second ring, right? Actually, we have. I think we should write this right here. Now, before your chemistry students start saying, "Oh, dude, you're wrong," we're gonna say we have a lim a set of numbers here. We've got. So here's the nucleus, right? There's. Hey, what atom is this? Can you? It's chlorine. Well, someone's like, "Yeah," because it says it right there. I read. Yeah. Someone's like, "How'd you know that?" I read. Okay, but here's the thing. Start thinking interchange. Oh, uh, atom number 17. Oh, that's chlorine. When we say atom number, we're referring to its atomic number. But when I say chlorine 35, notice I had to say chlorine 35. All right, chlorine 35, it's an isotope. Okay. So here's your first ring, second ring. Okay. So first ring, maximum. All right, that's maximum. Maximum electrons is going to be two. Let me reword that. It's going to have a maximum number of two. I'm writing the symbol 2e, e with a little negative charge because electrons are negative. Okay, for the sake of this section, sake of this exercise, all right, the max is going to be eight electrons for this ring and that ring. I think I could write that better. Okay. There's my little symbol for that. Okay. So let's go ahead and do the, let's go let's do uh, let's do carbon fourteen. The next page has carbon fourteen, right? Okay, so I want you to do carbon 14. What's the number of protons? Six. What's the number of neutrons? Eight. Eight. Okay, eight and four, eight four, and 14 gives you that eight plus six. I'm going to give you that 14. Okay, uh, how many electrons can go in the first ring? Two. So, boom, boom. All right. How many are left? Four. Four. One, two, three, four. Now, try, I tried to space them out because it's something called Vesper theory, which you learn in chemistry. I'm not going to give that to you now. It just because uh, electrons are, and this is like this is not fixed. We know that we know now that electrons are moving around. This is based on what's called the Bohr model, but this works for our purposes because the whole idea is get you to identify the number of electrons in the outer energy level so we can predict chemical behavior. So what about that one? What about this one? I have a question about carbon 14. Yes. So wait, does it still have a maximum of eight electrons in the outer shell? Yes. Okay. okay. It's got a maximum. So Four. now what, how many could go there? Four. Four more. Four more, which is what the next, last page of the handout. So I'm going to close this. Let's, get, let's do this. Move here. So now when you do this, this is how, how this works. So we said, what? Carbon. How many electrons were out in the outer energy level? Outer energy level? Four. Four. How many remain? Four. Four. Okay, here's a simple way to do this. Take eight minus whatever you have in this number to get this number, all right? And you're gonna notice some similar patterns. The only time you don't do eight is which atom up here? Hydrogen. Hydrogen, you'd say two minus that. It's the, it's the, it's the maximum capacity or possibility of that energy ring minus the number of electrons that are in that energy ring to figure out how many are left over. Okay, we're going to run out of time. So um, your homework is going to be to look up information on properties of water. So um, we're going to, this is what's going to happen. I want you, you're going to take this, 
fill it out, we'll go through it. Ms. Farouk has an awesome podcast where she walks through a PowerPoint that's similar to these images. It's like 10 minutes. If you watch that and fill this out, you'll, be, you'll have a 10 minute homework assignment. So that's your homework. Um, and go ahead and stop recording.